Hello everyone. The White Army is blessed to have Dr. Yadukur S., an Associate Professor, Forensic Medicine and Toxicology at Ames Hyderabad as our teacher and mentor today. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Thank you very much. Sir will be taking the class for us on the organophosphorus poisoning. I welcome all the active members to this session. With the permission of the mentor, let's begin the session. Shall I share my uh, screen? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, very good evening to all the listeners and my dear fellow friends. Today we'll be discussing regarding uh, the organophosphorus compounds. So I'll be uh, more precise. So it will be a broad perspective like agrochemical poison. So I'll be dealing more of organophosphorus poisoning. Since I'm a forensic uh, background person, I'll be dealing more on the medical aspects as well, because toxicology also comes under forensic medicine. Not much, uh, not, not uh, wasting much of the time, we'll start with the organophosphorus. Yes, uh, coming to the classification of organophosphorus, there are agrochemical uh, poisons assets. There are so many poisons like herbicides, Insecticides, fungicides, rodenticides, acaricides, molluscicides, and there are other miscellaneous poisons. Among all these things, two are very important for us. One is insecticide, which we are going to discuss today, that is organophosphorus, organochloride, and carbamates. And the next one is the rodenticides. The rodenticides are nothing but our phosphate group of poisons, which we commonly use as rat poison, which has uh, comparatively increased, especially in the metro region. However, organophosphorus still leads the chart in case of poisoning in rural India. So these organophosphorates are chemically divided into two groups. As we all know, one is called as alkyl group and another one is called as aryl group. Alkyl group consists of malathion, PEPP, and OMBA. These are the things which uh, the farmers commonly use. Second thing is TIC-20. I think we are, most of us would have heard this term TIC-20 poisoning. This is aryl group of organophosphorus. And in aryl, again, we have parathion and metacid. These TIC-20 and metacid are most common organophosphorate poisonings which we commonly encounter in our clinical practice. Now, before going to the signs and symptoms of organophosphorus and the treatment per se, we have to know the basics of organophosphorus. What exactly does organophosphorus compound does to our body? So once we know the pathophysiology of that, we can easily treat the poison. We all know regarding acetylcholine, how it is in the body. In the presence of choline estrase, this acetylcholine at the myoneural junction or the synaptic junction, it is divided into choline and acetic acid. This is a normal phenomenon. The choline estrase helps in hydrolysis of acetylcholine into choline and acetic acid. So I have made a, a, a pictorial represent, uh, representation so that we can understand the organophosphorus uh, compound much better. So this, if you think this as a synapse, you can see this a square block. That is what we call it as acetylcholine. So acetylcholine will be stored like a vesicle at the nerve ends. These are the acetylcholine which are present in the vesicles. Whenever a signal comes, this will be released 
and this will go and bind to the receptor site you can see the receptor site the acetylcholine goes and binds to that particular receptor so what happens normally is the star the blue color star which you are saying these are the acetylcholine esterases so these are the enzymes so what does this enzyme does it it helps in the hydrolysis of this acetylcholine so when these enzymes are working there is normal release of acetylcholine and there is hydrolysis into uh, the product what happens here in op poisoning is what we are concerned here so if you see this red ball that is the op compound what this op compound does is it will block this enzyme acetylcholine esterase so whenever this the star which was rotating earlier is blocked now by the organophosphorus compound so what happens when this enzyme is not normally functioning when this occurs there is increase in acetylcholine you can see there is the black squares which are increased that is nothing but the acetylcholine there is increase amount of acetylcholine in the body so this is the pathophysiology of organophosphorus poisoning now we'll go to the signs and symptoms of organophosphorus compounds as we all know we have studied in the second year as well in the pharmac and uh, in the final year and when we are exposed to the cases we know in the emergency department the signs and symptoms of organophosphorus compound is basically divided into three main types the three main types are one is muscarinic symptoms second is nicotinic symptoms and the third one is cns related symptoms the muscarinic symptoms why it occurs because the receptors are m1 m2 m3 m4 and m5 we all know the location of these receptors m1 is predominantly in the cns i will not going to name all those things m1 is predominantly in the cns m2 in the cvs related to the heart m3 is more or less in the gi tract m4 and m5 is not that significant and nicotinic symptoms are related to the receptors uh, what are the two receptors one is nn and nm these are basically the skeletal muscles and then we have cns symptoms now we we'll look on look into to the symptoms as such muscarinic effects we can easily remember the muscarinic effects by the mnemonic dumbbells what is this dumbbells d is for diarrhea u is for urination m is for meiosis b is for bronchospasm e emesis and l is for lacrimation s is for salivation basically what you have to think is all muscarinic are in the gland so whenever there is increased secretion all these things occur this is the muscarinic effects which can be easily remembered by this mnemonic dumbbells next we have nicotinic effects what are these nicotinic effects are the fasciculations muscle weakness hypertension fatigability this is mainly because of the nn and nm receptors which are present in the body and next we have cns effects like headache tremors delirium ataxia slurred speech these are the cns effects which commonly seen in case of organophosphorus poisoning apart from these main types of symptoms we do have respiratory failure in case of organophosphorus poisoning what there are two types of respiratory failure type 1 and type 2 what is this type 1 paralysis is basically due to the acute cholinergic crisis as i told the pathophysiology there is acute rise in acetylcholine in the body that gives rise to type 1 paralysis it usually occurs within 24 hours of the consumption of the compound next we have type 2 paralysis which is commonly as in your viva as well as in the exam that is intermediate syndrome the intermediate syndrome is nothing but 
type 2 paralysis which we commonly see in op poison when it occurs usually between 24 to 96 hours of the consumption of op poison and why it occurs it is due to the sustained over stimulation of neuromuscular junction by high concentration of acetylcholine you may ask acetylcholine already it is there initially why this intermediate syndrome occurs there is slow release of this op compound from the fat tissues this is the reason for this intermediate syndrome so now we have seen the signs and symptoms of op poisoning the three types and the respiratory failure now how do you diagnose a case of op poisoning i think most of the interns and the final year students will be you know um, they would have read the theory and immediately when they go to the medicine ward uh, a poisoning case comes and they'll tell sir this is a case of op poisoning if the professor says why the reason they gave is that it smells like garlic yes you are right theoretically but most of the uh, hospitals if you have seen the cases of op poisoning uh, it is like difficult the intern may smell it like a garlic but a professor will smell like a kerosene so it is subjective remember theoretically yes you are right op poison smells like garlic but practically when you are exposed in the hospital we see most of the op poison uh, uh, whoever has taken op poison usually they will combine that with alcohol so this smell thing is subjective and you cannot you know easily diagnose just because of the smell garlic smell in that particular patient because practically in most of the cases a person would have consumed alcohol along with uh, the op compound so you you will definitely not get that typical garlic smell so what other things we have to look for to diagnose a case of op poisoning garlic smell as i said it is subjective so we have to look into something which is objective even the intern a final year student and the professor should agree that this this is a case of op poisoning what is that it is the measurement of choline esterase level so choline esterase level below 50% usually you will see the symptoms and there are two types we know rbc choline esterase and plasma choline esterase level commonly asked neat question is that which is more specific which is more preferred rbc choline esterase or plasma choline esterase you remember rbc choline esterase is more preferable than plasma choline esterase you may ask the question why because plasma choline esterase level is decreased in certain other diseases like cirrhosis jaundice and other liver related diseases next we can do atropin chain uh, challenge by giving atropin there are electromuscular uh, studies p night toxicological uh, tests like p nitrophenol test and uh, tlc that is thin layer chromatography and routinely we send it for the um, cbc and all those things so ancillary investigation you will see leukocytosis anion gap acidosis and high hematopoiesis so these are the basis for diagnosis of op poisoning next coming to the treatment whenever a case of op poison comes and you are the lone doctor or you are practicing in the emergency department remember as a doctor we have two responsibilities one to save the patient of the uh, to save the life of the patient second is legal responsibility so if you are a doctor in the emergency and a case of op poison comes two responsibilities first you have to inform the police because it is a medical legal case so any medical legal case we have to inform the police it doesn't matter if you immediately uh, report because it is a life saving procedure you do the first aid first and then you have to report to the police basically we have two responsibilities as a doctor one is legal responsibilities another is medical responsibility now coming to the medical or the treatment aspect of op poisoning treatment aspect of op poisoning commonly we have decontamination these are the steps 
antidotes, supportive measures, prevention of further exposure, treatment in case of pregnant women, and the medical legal responsibility of a doctor. We'll go one by one. First is decontamination. Whenever a case of OP poison comes to your hospital or a clinic, first thing you have to assess is what is the mode of uh, intake or mode of uh, the drug which has come into the body, whether it is due to oral, skin, inhalation, or some other means. In our Indian setup or in our Indian set, uh, scenario, most of the cases, if it is acute poisoning, it will be due to oral consumption of the OP poison. But rarely or uh, which is not that common, we can get chronic OP poisoning, uh, usually in case of farmers who are uh, exposed to the sprays of OP compound. So it depends on the route of exposure, thorough decontamination should be done. And commonly what we follow is whenever a case of OP comes, if we are taken orally, we will remove the cloths and clean the body so that there is no absorption further. Next is gastric lavage. Most of the hospital have a question regarding that. Should we do gastric lavage in all the cases of poisoning or not? But what the rule says is preferably gastric lavage should be done within one hour of the consumption, oral consumption of the compound. If it is late, it is of no use because the compound would have been observed. But practically, it will be difficult because the person doesn't know when he has taken. It is usually the third person who gets into the hospital and we normally do the gastric lavage. We have to repeat it till we get a clear fluid. And the third uh, thing is referred patient. Usually patient will go from one hospital to another. Initially will be treated in a PSC, then a medical college and then to a tertiary hospital. So you have to ask the history first whether a gastric lavage has been done or not. If it is done, no need to repeat it again and again. And remember, I said legal responsibility. Whenever you do a gastric lavage, collect 30 to 50 ml of the gastric lavage for the toxicological analysis. Next, coming to the antidotes, which are used in OP compounds, OP uh, poisoning. The commonly used antidotes in OP poisoning is, we all know, atropin. Second is oxine group, that is pyridoxine, which is commonly used, what we call it as PAM. Next is diacetyl monoxine, or what we call as DAM. Obidoxine, all three are oxine group. And then we have glycopyrrolate. So these are the commonly used antidotes in case of OP poisoning. Now we'll look back into the the pathophysiology which I told in case of organophosphorus compound. So when we look into the pathophysiology, there are two major problems which occur due to OP poison. One, there was excess of acetylcholine in the body. The black square things which you are looking, those are the acetylcholine. There is increased number of acetylcholine in the body. The second problem is the enzyme is not functioning because of the OP compound. You can see that red ball that is the OP compound which has blocked that blue color star that is the enzyme. So two major problems we have in OP compound. So what we have to do is we have to take these two problems and OP treatment is as simple as that. So to remove this acetyl excess acetylcholine in the body, we have another drug. The drug is atropin, which we commonly use. So what atropin does is the excess of acetylcholine action will be rendered by the atropin. One problem is solved. Another problem is the enzyme deactivation. The enzyme we have to reactivate it now. So how does that work? So we'll have oxymes. What this oxyme does is it dephosphorylizes with the OP compound. You can see the triangular green triangle that combines with the OP compound. 
and then it takes away the rupee compound so that now the enzyme works normally so the two problems we have solved the two problems that is the treatment it's as easy as that in op compound so how does atropine work in case of op poisoning <clears throat> we all know it is the readily available best antidote against all op poisoning irrespective uh, of the type aryl or alkyl group atropine is the first line of treatment for us what it does it inactivates acetylcholine arrest muscarinic effects remember atropine will arrest only the muscarinic effects when we saw the symptoms there were three different types one is muscarinic nicotinic and cnx but atropine will arrest only the muscarinic effects but not the nicotinic action and what is the dose it dose depends on the severity of the poisoning how do you know the severity of the poisoning based on the choline stress level is it 50% 30 40 10% depending on the enzyme level will give the atropine but what is the standard dose of atropine which is commonly given you have two options the first option is you can give 1 mg bolus immediately followed by 1 to 2 mg every 15 minutes till there is atropinization this is the first option to give atropine and the second option is like continuous infusion of atropine what is the dose the average dose is 40 mg per day you can continuously infuse atropine till there is atropinization so atropine is the drug of choice for op poisoning two options one you can give bolus and second you can give continuous infusion till the person reaches atropinization what is atropinization actually means we all know op poison what it causes meiosis so is it if you give atropine it causes dilatation of the eye so we have to look for the eye if it is dilated do we think it is atropinization no this is the common mistake young doctors do you give atropine we know the action of atropine it causes dilatation of the pupil but it is one of the criteria but not the whole and sole criteria to tell it is atropinized so what are the other criteria we have to see yes first thing is we have to see for drying of secretion as i said in op compound the first symptoms will be there is increase in secretion so you have to look in for the drying of secretion in atropinization second thing is tachycardia tachycardia more heart rate is more than 80 systolic bp should be more than 80 mm of mercury there should be clear chest there should be no um, disturbance as such and you have to see for dry axilla so whenever you fulfill this criteria you mean that it is atropinization remember just the pupillary dilatation is not the only criteria among this that is also one of the criteria to tell that the person is atropinized next is severe atropinization which uh, over enthusiastically few doctors give more atropine so that we have to you know control the op compound and sometimes we end up in uh, giving more atropine and as medicos i think we have seen it in icus when uh, the patient start uh, scolding the nurses the uh, icu staff and even the uh, professors were during the rounds so what happens is there will be altered behavior in the person there will be agitation there will be tachycardia so whenever you give more atropinization what we do in the icu icu is we we'll just tie the um, you know limbs so that the person will not uh, speak or, or will get up suddenly okay so these are the signs of severe atropinization so everything is fine like uh, you can give atropine we uh, told this is the drug of choice but what about in case of pregnancy pregnancy we should not give atropine i repeat 
we should not give atropine during pregnancy again this is the question commonly asked in entrance what is the drug of choice of op poisoning in case of pregnancy the answer is glycopyrrolate glycopyrrolate is preferred than atropine because this drug doesn't cross the blood brain barrier so this is the drug of choice in case of pregnancy what about oxen so i told you two problems the first problem is solved by the atropine that is excess acetylcholine the second problem which i told is the enzyme it is blocked by the op compounds so what does this oxime does commonly used oxime is pam that is pralidoxime dam diacetyl monooxime and abidoxime basically these are the cholinesterase reactivators the op compounds binds to the esteric site of the enzyme and inactivate it this is the this we all know what oximes does is it binds with these phosphoryl group of this esteric site of the enzyme thus making it free uh, for you to understand i have made a simple video and see here this is the choline esterase enzyme which has two sites asterisk site so what oxime does is it attaches to the anionic site of the enzyme it oxime and reacts with phosphorus atom forming oxime phosphorate and reactivates the choline esterase you can see the picture here there is anionic site there is esteric site and this is the the green color which you are seeing is the choline esterase a is anionic site e is esteric site so what this op compound does is op compounds the red triangle which you are seeing for your understanding it binds to the esteric site what this oxime does is it binds to the anionic site you can see here the yellow block that is the oxime so oxime binds to anionic site op is already there red color so what this oxime does is it has a connection that is deposphorylize the op compound so it has a connection with the you can see the yellow block now has a connection with the red triangle there so it has deposphorylized now what it does is it removes the op compound so whenever the op compound is out the enzyme is free that it reactivates the choline esterase enzyme thus choline esterase become active in the body so the second problem is solved by the oxime another problem is there with the oxime there is something called as aging once there is aging it is irreversible so to give oxime it should be uh, before the aging of the enzyme or else it is of no use a continue treatment whenever the patient is admitted in the ward or in the icu the professor or the team or the unit always sees two things to avoid in case of op poisoning first phase is acute phase that we have managed it quite clearly with atropine oxime and all the other general features and the second thing which i told you is the intermediate syndrome that is a type 2 paralysis which commonly occurs in case of op poisoning what is the speciality here is it occurs after 48 hours of the intake of op compounds there will be uh, targeting the neck muscles this is one important thing that you have to notice whenever a case of op poison is admitted in icu remember always the doctor the professor asks for neck flexion what is the reason for that if the person can hold the neck neck holding exercises or they will test the neck muscles why because to rule out immediate syndrome whether still the op compound is present or not okay that is the reason why they test for the neck flexors the intermediate syndrome usually the proximal muscles of the limb are involved 
And the third important thing which occurs in opioid poisoning is the delayed polyneuropathy. What is the major difference between intermediate syndrome and delayed polyneuropathy is that in delayed polyneuropathy, you have symmetrical distal muscle involvement and usually presents with foot drop. Suppose all the treatment fails and you are not able to, you know, uh, uh, the patient is dead. What you have to do is, first thing is declare death with all the protocols in your hospital. And the second important thing, as I told, this is a medical legal case, you have to intimate the police. I'll briefly tell about uh, the autopsy findings in case of OP uh, poisons. External and internal, as we commonly uh, see. Externally, the characteristic odor, if it is only OP, you can see garlic-like uh, froth at mouth and nose. Cyanosis, you can see in the extremities. Constricted pupils, if not treated. Internal findings in case of OP poisoning, there is congestion of GI tract with kerosene-like odor in the contents. Pulmonary and cerebral edema, generalized visceral congestion. This is this. Since it is a poisoning case, usually we'll take the viscera for the FSL, that is Forensic Science Laboratory. What are the things we'll take? Stomach and its contents, proximal part of the intestine, liver, 500 grams, kidney, half of each kidney or the entire kidney, blood usually we'll take and we have to uh, preserve that. What is the preservative used commonly? Remember, for histopathological, it is different. For toxicological analysis, it is different. Usually, in peripheral, what they do is they'll just add saturated sodium chloride, just salt solution, saturated sodium chloride solution to preserve all these things. Blood, we usually take fluoride or oxalate. There's one uh, thing which you have to remember similar to organophosphorus poisoning, carbamate poisoning. This also is part of agrochemical poisoning. What is this carbonate poisoning is? It is very similar to OP poisoning, except the fact that oxygen should not be given. You can use the atropin, but you should not use the oxygen. What is the reason why, should, why we should not use oxygen is Because the carbamate poisoning, the carbamate poisons occupy the A site, anionic site of the enzyme. We all know the oxygens also occupy the anionic site. So when you give oxygens, it will try to go to the same site, which is already occupied by the carbamate poisoning. That's why oxygens are contraindicated or better not to give in case of carbamate poisoning. Whereas in case of OB poisoning, you can give oxygens because it is in the E site. To wind up uh, organophosphorus, I want to end with this slide. Terrorism and OP poisoning. I think you would be wondering what is OP poisoning doing here with terrorism? We just see in the rural India, we see uh, OP poisoning with farmers and all those things. What is this terrorism doing with OP poisoning? We all know OP poison or you know insecticides is commonly uh, done in rural India, but we don't know regarding few gases or what we call it as nerve gases, which are also similar in action to OP poisoning, which are used in terrorism. That is. The organophosphates, which are very rapidly acting, such as tabun, sarin, soman, these are what we call it as the nerve gases, which are similar in action to OP poison, but very rapidly acting, which is commonly used for chemical warfare. Hope we will not see this uh, nerve gases sooner or later in our country. Thank you all for listening to uh, my talk. If any doubts are there, please let me know.
uh, sir, since there are no uh, questions on YouTube and there's one question in here. So the question says, uh, should we use only atropine and carbamate poisoning or is there anything else? No, no. In the carbamate poisoning, only atropine is better used and uh, the general uh, treatment protocol. We should not use octanes. Okay, sir. Uh, son, since there are no more questions on YouTube okay. and Zoom also, so can I conclude the session, sir? Yes, yes, thank you. It was indeed a comprehensive class. The explanation was very useful for us. Thank you so much, sir, for teaching and guiding us. We are ever grateful to you. And we need your blessings, guidance, and support throughout. It was a great effort by all the active listeners who joined us for the session. We also thank all of the active listeners for enthusiastically answering and asking questions. A very warm thank you to one and all. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone.